Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wednesday Lowy Lunch. I'm Michael Fully Love, the Director of the Global Issues Program here at the Institute. Uh, one thing I sometimes feel is that we talk insufficiently about human rights at the Lowy Institute. Most of, uh, we're all realists here at the Institute, we're all focused on state competition and state interests and sometimes um, human rights and human values get squeezed out a little bit I think at the edges and so it's um, a great pleasure because of that to be welcoming Professor David Kinley from Sydney University to talk to us today about human rights and the global economy. As David, I know, will say to us, um, both the <coughs> universal human rights movement and the globalisation movement, if you like, have a lot of similarities, um, and yet they, they are very different beasts with different institutions and, and different approaches. And um, uh, I think it will be very interesting to hear from David about how these two phenomena interrelate. David holds the Chair in Human Rights Law at Sydney University. He is the author of a terrific book by, uh, published by Cambridge University Press, Civilising Globalisation, Human Rights and the Global Economy, which will provide the basis for some of his talk today. He's the editor and author of a number of other books, including Corporations and Human Rights, The World Trade Organisation and Human Rights, as well as Principled Engagement, Promoting Human Rights in Pariah States. He lectures and speaks all over the world, including, I'm pleased to say today, at the Lowy Institute, David Kinley. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much for that generous introduction and applause. Um, I'm delighted to, uh, to be here. I do, when I realise that Michael, talking about the, the book that was uh, just recently published, how uninventive the title of this lecture is, indeed how apparently self-advertising it is, and I suppose it is. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start off by throwing out some trigger issues, trigger comments uh, to do with this connection between civilizing globalization, human rights and the global economy. It's 25 years, yet last year, since Bhopal, which for many people marked a watershed in, in corporate skullduggery. Google has its China dilemma at the moment. There are these things called EPZs and ETZs, but are they export or are they exploit? Shell settled its case with, that was brought by the Wiwa family, Ken Sara Wiwa, 13 years after it was first initiated in the United States. Trafigura has had this extraordinary toxic oil, uh, oil waste dumping in the Côte d'Ivoire and then tried to silence it through the British press. We've had fair trade branding and now corporate social responsibility. We have Nike Watch on the blogosphere and we have Blackwater, now XE, let loose in Iraq. And then we have just about any coal mining corporation in China. All of these are the sorts of things that make you think about human rights in the global economy, often, though not always, the bad things. And that is in part one of the reasons why I approached the project and approached writing the book. But I do think it only tells half of the story. And I think this is an important point that I want to get across here. And that is that the global economy, including corporations, have actually advanced human rights, as well as at times detracted it. Um, they have alleviated poverty uh, through jobs, through, through FDI, through remittances, through technology transfer, through infrastructure building, taxes. Uh, all of that has enabled poor states, at least given them the capacity, to increase the welfare of their citizens. And that's really the double entendre of the, of the, of the, uh, of the book. Um, this is a problem for me, this use of this double entendre all the time, civilizing globalization. On the one hand, it civilizes, but it also needs to be civilized. I have a French wife, and I'm always saying this double entendre, and she just shrugs. Any of you have had experience of French men or women close up, you know they shrug all the time. And this double entendre, of course, doesn't mean anything for the French. The double hearing is a nonsense. Uh, but of course, we, in the English language, we know very well what double entendre means, so I continue to use it. So the civilizing globalization has these two, has these two sides to it. Now, there are three basic questions that I seek to address uh, in the project and in the book, and I'm very briefly going to go over them here. The first of those is, what is the significance of this relationship between human rights and the global economy? Um, secondly, what can we do that would assist the global economy to pursue, to uphold, to promote human rights uh, ends? And then finally, who's responsible for all of that? The significance, well, 
I think the significance is that they fundamentally need each other. And this is something that both sides tend to forget. That is, uh, that the economy is an essential means by which human rights can achieve their ends. And that human rights are an essential legitimacy and a goal for the economy. The two do need each other in that respect. The challenge is to have both sides understand and appreciate the other perspective, indeed their own perspective. Being a human rights lawyer, I find myself launching, relaunching, because it's been a long time since I've done it, into the classical economists and some of the less classical economists in this, in this project. And it was very edifying to, to look at what people like, uh, like Adam Smith were talking about as a classic laissez-faire economist, because 18 years before he wrote The Wealth of Nations, he, he wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And for him, the wealth of nations, the idea of the free market economy, was merely a means to achieve uh, the ends that he espoused uh, uh, in the moral sentiments. That is, to try and assist those on the margins of society. The same even with Ricardo, who talked about individual advantage, but it was connected to universal good. Uh, and of course, John Maynard Keynes, who's had a resurgence now, um, maybe not in his physical form, but certainly in his intellectual form. Um, uh, and he was always a, an advocate of this idea of, of recognizing um, what could be done with uh, a free market economy. Though he does have wonderful quotations. Again, I, I'd forgotten what a witty, I suppose in the intellectual sense, man he could be. But he did talk about the capitalism's astounding belief that, that, um, that it, would, uh, uh, it would help that, that men would do the, the greatest and most appalling things for the betterment of men. Um, he found this an astounding belief, but yet one that capitalism was pursuing. All in all, then, distributive equity, it seems, coming out of the classical economists and, of course, modern-day economists, uh, is an important goal of what the economy should be all about. It's not to say that human rights would destroy the, the, the goose that's laying the golden egg, but rather that it is assisting uh, the goose in laying those eggs. Uh, it is to go back to the humanist sentiments of the Enlightenment, this, uh, which, which is nowadays considered, from Peter onwards, as creatively destructive. You can see that in modern day uh, uh, global economy, commerce, uh, the whole idea, as I mentioned a moment ago, of corporate social responsibility, some of you, in, some of you in the room may well be involved in that. It was a, a McKinsey's uh, survey uh, in 2007 looking at 4,500 CEOs, and 80% of them felt that uh, what their business was about was much more than simply profit, was much more than uh, the Milton Friedman notion of the business of business is business. Uh, you may say that that's lip service, but there is a, a substantial amount of uh, backing up in practice in that as well. Uh, many companies do recognize that their commercial license to operate is dependent to some extent on their social license to operate. International trade law. Um, if you look at the preamble to the WTO, or indeed to the EU, but the WTO, 154 nations have signed up to this, and it doesn't talk about free trade, at least not alone. What it talks about in its preamble is about uplifting labor standards, increasing uh, wealth across poor countries as well as rich countries. And yet, is that preamble pursued? Aid. You would expect, perhaps, aid to be particularly involved in, uh, in pursuing human rights. There is this connection, at least viscerally, one would believe, between the alleviation of poverty and the promotion of human rights. But in fact, the way in which most aid agencies have done it, uh, the, the exceptions are the Nordic uh, uh, aid agencies, but certainly the bank, the, the, the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank, do it by proxy. They don't really talk about human rights. They talk about things like global governance, good governance, and they talk about the rule of law. Um, my second point then is what needs to be done to better assist the... Uh, the ends of human rights by the global economy. And I think here, and, and I should say that I'm unapologetic about this, I see, as I alluded to earlier, that the global economy is there for ends that are beyond merely its own ends of greater uh, growth, greater wealth. That wealth is to be used for certain uh, noble, one would hope, just social just ends. The first thing I think to be said about how um, the global economy can assist us is to change mindsets on both sides uh, of the debate. There really is still a cogn cognitive dissonance between those who are the particularly the strident human rights advocates and those on the other side of uh, 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 the economy. On the corporate um, aid, finance, trade side, 
there is often a failure to see the relevance of human rights to their cause. The mathematically minded economists, who I find the hardest to get into, obviously enough, beyond the behavior, behavioralist uh, economists, often will see human rights as immeasurable externalities. Growth is the sole aim of the economy for many economists, not to be concerned with how it is to be achieved, nor indeed necessarily how wealth is to be distributed. That's somebody else's problem, not uh, the, the concern of economists. And then thirdly, in any case, the argument would go from that side of the debate. Human rights are surely a state responsibility. How can they be considered a private sector responsibility? But that's only one side of it, because on the other side, the human rights arguments, the strident human rights advocates, there are real problems as well. Perhaps I'm more familiar with those sitting uh, within them. And that is basically a failure, a really gross failure, to treat the economy with respect. More often, it's treated with disdain, dislike, and distrust. Sometimes it is preposterously so. I remember one of the quotes that I came across was um, an organization in the United States promoting the idea that WTO was the most evil organization that mankind had ever produced. And you think, well, have you read history? I mean, yes, the WTO may, may have problems, but can it be considered the most evil organization that has ever been produced? No. I think all of this is a serious mistake from that side of the debate. The economy is not all bad. In any case, uh, if you do want to achieve some sort of rapprochement with its detrimental dimensions, you've got to understand the beast in order to do that. And in any case, along with that understanding, will come the benefit of being able to promote the good parts of the economy. So you've got to get in there and you've got to get your hands dirty as a human rights uh, advocate. Moral high ground is all very well, uh, particularly if it's on criticism. But the real battle to try and enhance the uh, the, the, the poorly fed and the poorly educated and the poorly housed is at the bottom uh, in the trenches where the economy has uh, its real bite. Uh, and those elements that I mentioned are the very elements of uh, a human rights notion of a dignified life. So the two sides, as I say, do need to get closer together. You have problems, despite what I said a few moments ago about the McKinsey survey, you do have problems within the corporate sector. And I've got to say that an awful lot of it comes from uh, ignorance and short-sightedness, rather than necessarily being malign, malicious in the terms of corporations. It is that sort of, it's not our concern, the blinkered uh, view. That, I think, has to, be, uh, uh, has to be addressed. International trade, well, going back to my preambular point, we do have to look and take seriously at a political level uh, what uh, the preambles uh, say. And we have to then deal with these big, they're not legal, but political problems of the north on the one side promoting free trade in some, some areas, but then in agriculture, for instance, not promoting free trade. Now that has a real serious detrimental effect for farmers in the south. But the south is not innocent in all of this either, because the south has this reticence, this, this resistance to the idea that human rights should ever be attached to trade. Some of that may be for good reasons, but some of that also is for less good reasons uh, in promotion and protection of their, uh, the rights of their individuals and citizens. So you have to take human rights, uh, uh, taking aid, sorry, uh, seriously uh, as a human rights tool. I, I think that um, the idea that, that, that um, aid can assist human rights is a very important one, but one that has dropped beneath the radar. Uh, and it's much more than simply increasing the amount of aid uh, that has been dedicated. We're nowhere near the 0.7% that the wealthy nations have promised to reach of GDP of aid. We, in this country, is 0.3, 0.4. There's only four, five small nations, relatively small nations, that reach that. Uh, the richest nations are nowhere near it. It's not just the quantity, it's also the efficacy of it. Um, William Easterly, Bill Easterly, has calculated, it has to be a calculation, that 2.5 trillion US aid has been pumped into the southern economies since the Second World War. And he asks the question fairly, it's, a, it's an easy question to ask, uh, what can we say we've achieved for that amount of money? Surely the efficacy uh, uh, has yet to be uh, achieved. Uh, I'm wary about the sorts of things that we can do to, to, to assist this. Uh, as a lawyer, I have concerns about human rights-based human rights -based approaches to development. I'm deeply concerned about the human rights uh, communities concerned to push the right to development. I think that this is a real mistake. I think it's doomed, and I think it's a distraction of effort uh, and energy, and I think we'll have to talk about that uh, later. 
So who is responsible for all of this uh, if we are going to seek to put it on somebody's shoulders? Well, there are an array of bodies overall. It's the public, the private, domestic, and international. But, and I have to say this perhaps to an audience like this, it would be obvious, within international law fraternities, perhaps less obvious. I do think that ultimately the responsibility has to be on the, the, the shoulders of the states. I say this because it's, and I say why well, it might be somewhat unfashionable, because in international law circles at the moment there's this resurgence, resurgence of non-state actors as being the new kids on the block, and they should be taking responsibility uh, for, uh, for human rights uh, for human rights obligations, not just state. That may be so, but ultimately it will be the states that put that responsibility on them. So it does, all roads do still lead back to the states. There is, a, there is the social contract, again, maybe somewhat on festival, but it is there, and that contract is an economic one as well, that you use the largesse that is brought in for social ends. Uh, and this would include, and can include, allowing a lot of, or some people earn, uh, to earn a lot of money and to do very well about, uh, out of their enterprise, but equally to say out of that there must be some sort of tax, literally, uh, that uh, is distributed further and wider. And that would include in promoting human rights ends. Let me just conclude by saying a few words about what I think the position, well, the position we are in at the moment. And, and it is one that a door, a door has been opened by, uh, by the global financial crisis. I was talking earlier to Michael that when the book was finished and I was just sending it off uh, to, um, to the publishers, uh, was in October 2008. Lehman's was disappearing down the toilet and I'm thinking I'm writing a book about the global economy and human rights. So, I mean, I did get some chance when it came back to do some alteration, but it certainly didn't uh, re... I couldn't reconfigure the book. But what it did do was, was emphasize in sharp relief what sorts of concerns one might pursue now and henceforth uh, uh, in this arena of the link between human rights and the global economy. Two things were, were thrust out into the open. One, these things you know well, one was the idea that risk is now paramount, something that has to be taken seriously. And what's more, not just financial risk, uh, but also environmental, social, and human rights risk. The second was a... Um, bubbling up to the surface of connectors. That is, people and issues that lie between the two arenas of human rights and the global economy. Not enough of these, but they are there. The IFIs are a perfect example of this. I think we've got some of the best, most pragmatically visionary heads of the, the IFIs at the moment, the international financial institutions. I'm not saying they're perfect, but they're a lot better than ones we've had in the recent past. Bob Zellick, at head of the bank, is, is talking about the age of responsibility, and he is now starting to engage directly with human rights issues. Pascal Lamy uh, has promoted the idea of intersecting trade with a, with a social end. He's promoting this idea of Geneva consensus to counter the Washington consensus. And even Strauss-Kahn, um, well, sorry, and Strauss-Kahn, not just even Strauss-Kahn, uh, at the head of the IMF. I mean, he's resurrected a near-death experience of the IMF with its tripling of its budget and the fact that it's now lending incredible amounts compared to what it was uh, two or three years ago. It, it lent $1 billion, one billion in 2007, uh, and it lent $160 billion in 2008 and 9. And what's more, it's, just, it's not just lending. There is a greater uh, use of grants uh, uh, with, without the need for payback. There's also this question of, of agenda setters, the individuals that I think are really important in this. Uh, Amatia Sen, I think, is, is, is quintessential in this. Sen's idea of looking at the way in which uh, development and freedom are connected to each other, uh, that it's not just about rights, um, uh, the assertion of rights, but the needs and the capabilities to make those rights a reality. Uh, here's an economist and a philosopher who really has thought through both sides of the debate. That's exceptional. Human rights folk don't do that, and the other public economists, public intellectual economists, don't do that. For all their worth, people like Stiglitz and Sachs just do not engage with human rights. Um, private sector development in aid has become a big issue, this public-private public partnerships, the whole notion of philanthropic capitalism, the enormous power uh, that uh, uh, Gates Foundation can have and the good that it can do it at four, million, four billion a year uh, coughing up in, in grants and, and loans is about the same level as AusAid. So it's a big player. But finally, there is still 
much to be done. And I think perhaps the biggest single disconnect in the area of global economy and human rights is with respect to global finance and human rights. Um, there are some exceptions that prove the rule in the Angelides Commission looking into the global, fi the global financial crisis in the US Congress at the moment. It was an interesting uh, testimony by a hedge fund manager who's talking about the fact that the global food crisis was not as many people, many people generally, but many people in the human rights community believed was, was, was promoted by subsidies for ethanol uh, production, i.e. moving away from staple foods into those that could uh, be converted into ethanol. It wasn't so much that, which maybe is a popular belief, but rather the fact that you've got commodity index commodity speculators who are picking up and, and hoarding these amounts of grains uh, in order to gain benefit, but without recognizing what the uh, consequences are for the poor trying to buy those grains. But really, we don't know what's going to be the consequences of, uh, um, uh, for human rights of this sort of casino culture that maybe we still have within uh, global finance rather than being a support for industry. We really don't know what the consequences are of the fact that the derivatives market is 20 times larger than real GDP, than the real economy. What is the consequence of that? We, we really don't know generally, and certainly in the human rights community, we don't know. And if there is a re-engagement of multilateral negotiations at the trade level, you will bet at some stage there will be a, not now, but there will be a push again for a multilateral agreement on investments, i.e. the freeing up of investments. It's the one area that free trade really has not been able to grasp. So uh, an MAI mark too. What are the consequences of this? Well, none of those have, are, are, can be answered easily here, and I'm not seeking to do so. In fact, it's what I'm doing uh, next, uh, another project and hopefully another book. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Uh, <clears throat> I think that was a really interesting talk, and I was particularly struck by um, David's willingness to challenge the human rights community from which he comes, I guess, or with which he spends, with whom he spends a lot of time. Um, sometimes I also find the arguments in that community a little simplistic. I was talking to somebody yesterday, um, and we were we were really struggling with human rights and the use of force, and it, it became clear to me that um, this person would would almost never sanction the use of force and yet because of all the sort of human rights um, effects of that um, and yet we know from the history in the 90s um, that sometimes in fact uh, the use of force is the lesser of two evils. So I think by, by similarly challenging the human rights community to look at the global economy I think you're performing a really useful service. Let me um, kick off the question and answer period if I can. Um, you talked a bit about um, North and South, which are old terms that w we don't hear so much anymore between the developed world and the developing world. Um, but let me ask you about China, because um, in terms of the link between development and freedom, it seems to that you spoke of, it seems to me China um, poses a new and different kind of challenge. On the one hand, um, the incredible development that China's had in recent decades has led to massive welfare increases to the Chinese people and, and improvements in their life, lives and their human rights. But of course, China explicitly separates um, the question of development from the question of human rights and, it, um, and particularly when it comes to political and civil rights, it, um, it, it does not buy the argument that uh, economic globalization requires, or economic rights, it requires the extension of political rights. So, so talk to us a little bit about your thoughts about China, if you would, in the context of this debate about the global economy and human rights. Yes, uh, thank you. I mean, obviously, that's a very, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the big panda in the room, isn't it? Uh, which I, the 800-pound panda in the room, which I didn't mention. Uh, you're quite right to pull it out. Uh, um, I went, to, rather bizarrely, to a, um, a conference in November uh, in Beijing, uh, hosted by the Chinese government on human rights. Uh, which was a very interesting experience, and that's the reason why I went. And they were extolling the virtues of their promotion of human rights in the economic, social, and cultural sense, saying, look, we're going to be the first country to reach the Millennium Development Goals. In fact, we've already reached it in terms of having poverty uh, by uh, lifting 250 million people in China out of poverty already. So we're doing good. Now, I think there's no doubt that we've got to give that credence, and I think too many, perhaps in the human rights community, will not. But on the other hand, not for a minute should you let them off with that and say, yeah, 
But what about uh, your, uh, your, um, uh, your legal system? Even when you're in the public glare, like with the Stern Hugh case, you still feel that it's perfectly normal, perfectly acceptable to close it up and indeed, indeed operate against your own international obligations because, well, we can do it. Um, so I think domestically uh, there is good, uh, but there is also bad and a lot of work to, to be done in China. The other dimension, of course, to China's human rights record is its uh, aid program, or in fact aid stroke trade program, particularly in Southeast Asia, but also in Africa. I mean, it's enormous. At the same conference, it was interesting how many of um, the acolyte countries in East and West Africa had come along, had been invited along to it. Clearly, they had been pumped with Chinese uh, uh, yuan over the last few years. And there's no doubt that some of that is good. I mean, they, they don't have the same sort of human rights or other conditionalities that we in the West put on. And many of those countries said, we like that. Now, there was a little bit of putting two fingers up to the West. There was no doubt about that as well. But good things were coming from it. Bad things as well, you know, not enough technology transfer, too many Chinese coming in and doing the work rather than the locals actually getting the benefit of that, of that, uh, of that new knowledge. So again, it's pluses and minuses, but I think that the key is to, to recognize that it is a big player and that it does some good as well as some bad, rather than sort of a blanket, oh no, you know, China, terrible, don't touch them.